we are live and we are back to put some balance back into your life. It's the balance breakdown. As always, Harry Powell joins me today and we're going to discuss uh, the UFC uh, Vegas 78 card in the apex that went down last Saturday night. Vicente Luque versus Rafael Dos Anjos, the Battle of Brazil in the main event. Co-main event seen Cub Swanson take on Hakim Dawadu. And we had some other good performances that we'll speak about as we progress in the old podcast. Just talking, Harry, before the podcast, I was saying I found this one a little bit tough to get through myself personally. A um, couple of good performances on it, though. I don't want to disparage the card. I'm just talking about me personally. I I watched the Bellator card Friday night. It went on. It was a long slog, a lot of fights, a couple of up and downs. And then maybe I just, maybe I wore myself out a little bit recording podcasts. And then it was a, a heavy, heavy weekend of MMA. But, uh, you know, this wasn't a dreadful card by any means. I just found a little bit that I couldn't get make that connection with it. And it kind of is what we talked about on the on the preview show, and Sean and Gray mentioned it as well. It's kind of a team with these kind of cards. It's like maybe the lack of jeopardy kind right. of affected it from my viewing perspective any which way. Um, and I think you can kind of say that about the main event as well. It might, like, I mean, there was a lack of, for me, the lack of drive or lack of want to finish the fight from both fighters. And we can get into that in just a minute, but... Um, I know you enjoyed the card. You you watched it back. Maybe that's the that, that's the key for cards like this, Harry. I think is that you don't really watch them or take them in live. Obviously enough, it's super late back there. You've other things going on, but you'll take them in the day after and kind of you can quickly scoot through the cards then. Yeah. So I mean, Jesus, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think you know. So, I just went. I just offloaded on you at the very at the very start. Sorry, man. <laughs> no, I was like, I was like, in my brain, I was formulating my answer, and I was like, oh fuck, I've got. Okay, there's lot. Okay, um. So first of all, I think you're right. I, I very rarely take cards in live. Um, if it's a big pay per view, I'll I'll stay up and and do the thing, right? Whatever it is. Um, especially if it's a if it's a a regional card, whether it's a Paris or or something similar, where it's easier for me to take it in, I will do. But these are these fight cards, especially the way that I watch them. They're something that I really need to concentrate on, right? And and I find it very difficult to really notice what's happening and really see the fight as I like to see it at six a.m. in the morning, right? Like that's tough for me. So, um, anyway. What did I think of the fight card? Like, I actually, the read I had of the fight card was Sean made a prediction ages ago, long time ago. And it was that we're going to see fights move to decision at the highest level more and more and more. And the lower the level the fight is, the more that we'll see a proliferation of finishes. And it feels to me that this card was a really, really good example of that because there were some fights that were quite low level in comparison to the cards that we have had in the last little while. I think that we should definitely kind of say when we disparage fights and we disparage maybe fighters, and some people might find it a little bit rude or, or, or ignorant, but I think you and I and, and Sean and, and maybe Graham and, and whoever else may be looking at this through the lens that we have to assess these fighters and these fights under the USC caliber that they are the best, they are the top in the business, top industry in the business who will promote the best fighters in the world to us or say that they will. And I, I mean, they had the lawsuit that came out and said that they've said that they have the best fighters in the world. It's announced in the court of law now, Harry. So it must be true. So um, that's why I would all, that's, solely why i would always kind of be little and because i maybe i'm giving a little bit of a warning here because there's going probably will be a little bit of that later on when we're talking but you know before we get into maybe the levels of fights and sorry for interrupting you your your kind of assessment is what i'm saying is it's basing off a U ufc caliber fighter and and ufc as an organization yeah absolutely and and i think that when when we are treated to a certain level of card that we have been in sort of the last five weeks on a row, really, when there's a card that it has the makings of what you would expect a good card to have. Enough fights, 12, 13 fights, 
a bunch of finishes, a bunch of interesting finishes, right? You don't, it's not often you get to see a twister. It's not often you get to see some of the performances that we saw in terms of what it looked like. If you just scroll to a Sherdog page or a topology page for the fight card and you had a look through it, you'd say, oh, Jesus, that's, that looks like a great fight card. Tons of finishes, must be tons of action. But I think that MMA is slowly changing in that, at least it has for me, that, and you know, I, you and I disagree on this sometimes, and Shawnee and I disagree on this sometimes, is I would much prefer to see a very technical back and forth, and action filled, fine, but a very back and forth action filled fight over more of uh, something that's slightly less technical, but way more action packed. And I think what we are seeing here or is the emergence of a pattern and that pattern is when you find fighters that are slightly lower level there are far more opportunities for fights to be finished and as mma grows in its maturity and fighters grow in their efficacy and in their skill it's far 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 harder to finish those fighters either there needs to be a big mistake or a big moment in a fight that creates those finishes and so this card to me, it wasn't necessarily the Jeopardy because I'm not I'm not somebody that generally looks at fights in terms of Jeopardy. It doesn't really affect me as much. What really affected me in this was I was looking at certain situations, looking at the analysis of it and recognizing that the fight card was quite low level. And so I'm looking and I don't get the same level of enjoyment for me as a fight fan, for me as an analyst. Now, there are actions that, there's action that we can break down. There's there's finishes we can break down. There's some really interesting performances. But overall, that's why it was more of a slog for me. Sure. Yeah. And that's totally understandable. And look at we we've said it before. We've been we've been pretty lucky with the quality of cards this year. There hasn't been. I mean, I think last year was pretty bad in 2021. Coming out of the pandemic wasn't great either at times. But we're you know, we can take one or two here, but we also have to be honest with the uh, assessing the card and the assessing the situation. And even if it is just one spread in a, amongst them a, a lot, we we have to we have to say how we feel, and we'll say how we feel right now about the main event: Vicente Luque versus Rafael de Sanos. Five rounds, a decision, a unanimous win for Vicente Luque. A big win for Vicente Luque. Harry coming off a, a double set of losses and uh, a bad bad injury as well coming off uh, a serious i think you know you could just credit Vicente Luque for for finding the will and the drive to come back and to want to come back after suffering a bad brain brain bleed against Jeff Neal in his last fight um crazy to think you know you suffer such a serious injury like that and and you want to come back and fight it's crazy it just shows how these men are and women are built inside the cage in the octagon no matter where they're fighting rafael de Sanos obviously on the wrong side of his decision um you know he'll be disappointed that he dropped on coming off his win against brian barbarena um he just met someone that was really suited to his style on saturday night i think harry in vicente luque and i spoke with sean briefly after the fight look at it not not another another kind of a dud of a main event really for being super critical it wasn't super super exciting but you know from a technical tactical point of view there was interesting battles throughout i'm sure you'll get into that in just a moment as well but talking to Sean, he said it was weird. I said it was weird, and we kind of couldn't put our finger on why we thought it was weird. And I kind of came to the conclusion, that I think, with both of these gentlemen, Harry, they almost had too much respect for one another to hurt each other badly in there on Saturday night. Um, I'm not sure how you feel about that assessment, but what was your thoughts on the fight and how it played out? So I think that my read was slightly different. My read was that... Vicente Luque is very, very aware of not getting hit too much, right? There were moments when I'm going to, I'm going to go now because I, there the, the thoughts are in my brain. I'm just going to, I'm just going to it off. Do it. The thing that, the thing that really struck me in this fight was we, we finally saw that at the age that RDA is, when he can't find his rhythm and when he can't find the significant portions of the fight where he's putting people in a takedown grind washing machine, that 
He just doesn't have the explosiveness, the athleticism and the power to sway fights his way. And for that reason, we saw that Vicente Luque had a ton of success. He would allow RDA to push him backwards. He would allow RDA to barrel on into something, knowing that he could cover up, take the shots, and he'd have an underhook and just reverse RDA immediately. I think for Vicente Luque, the the fear was there was a moment in either the first or the second round, I can't quite remember, but RDA did not want to stand in the pocket. He was not available in the pocket, but Luque hung around just a couple of seconds more and allowed that allowed him to land some really, really nice shots on RDA. Then RDA said, well, fuck it. If I'm going to have to be in the pocket, I'll be in the pocket a little bit. And he caught Luque with a couple of really nice combinations. They were both exchanging, but a couple of really nice combinations. And there was a moment where Luque... I think made a conscious decision that I don't want to be in those pocket situations. I don't want to be taking those shots. Now, is he, that- he even he even said that after the fight, Harry. He said that for the first round, he was like having been out for so long, and Jesus, you can imagine after coming back from a brain brain bleed as well. Oh, excuse me, a brain bleed as well. That's got to mess with you mentally. Um, and he did say that after the fight, he felt that he was a kind of uh, a little bit opposed to getting hit in the first round, which is understandable. And it took him a little bit to kind of get settled into the fight as well. Probably played a little bit of effect that mentality on his game plan too, but you ain't going to hear me criticize about that. No. And I think that when Vicente Luque understood that he was more adept in the clinch situations in uh, for this version of RDA, he just allowed the fight to play there, right? Like, I I wonder and I fear, because you and I are, you know, Vicente Luque is one of our favorite fighters. My and- favorite fighter in the whole wide world. What are we talking about here? Ever, ever. Right. We've adored him for a long time. Mm. One of the reasons why we have adored him for a long time, we saw glimpses, right? I think it was the fifth round or the fourth round. He dives on RDA, RDA jumps a guillotine, he reverses the guillotine, it was um, uh, Luke dives on a guillotine, RDA turns in, they're in front headlock, he sucker drags RDA, he's on the back, he's trying to choke him, like that, that level of fuck itness and just being able to go out, try stuff, take risks, do stuff, be in the pocket, land shots, you know, all of these, this this type of action-packed style that he has is, the, is something that you and I have both loved him for for a long time, but I think after a brain bleed and after such a serious injury, you're in a very, very difficult moral quandary. And that moral quandary is he doesn't know what else to do in his life than fighting. This is something he's done for a considerable portion of his life. He's very good at it. He's one of the best in the world. But you don't want to get hit now, you know? And so Vicente Luque goes out against RDA, who RDA himself is not what he was. And so we see that Luque's youth and that little bit more of athleticism that he has left in the tank was able to to really allow him to sprint away from RDA in some of the situations that RDA of five years ago might have really punished Luque in. But this had a... This fight, the, the thing that made it awkward or weird to me is we're looking at RDA on a decline and we're looking at Vicente Luque not fighting in inside of himself. And yeah, so and also I would also argue a little bit of a decline as well and we've oh, seen 100%. kind of that in the last couple of fights as well but you know what got him to the dance was that that ferociousness and that viciousness in times as well where he's putting himself in a level of danger to maybe give a shot to take a shot where that's not really there for him maybe anymore if he's thinking about his health and his well-being and you know that's that's totally fine if that's the decision that he wants to make for himself if he wants to put food on the table and i'm sure that's that was what you were kind of uh, alluding to anyway harry 100% um and i think that if he sticks around this level of fighter like if we saw Vicente Luque booked against Brian Barberena next i've got no problem with that you know I don't want to see Vicente Luque fighting Sean Brady. I don't want to see Vicente Luque fighting Jack Della Maddalena. I don't want to see Vicente Luque. I know he's got a fight book, but I don't want him fighting Ian Gary. You know, I don't need to see Vicente Luque fighting 
these levels of caliber of opponent in the same vein i do not want to see rafael dos Anjos fighting them either um rafael i don't know where he goes from here necessarily like you a win against brian barbarena is one thing a loss to vicente luque isn't the worst thing in the world but what are we what are we doing with weight class right we fought for Ziv most recently we're now back up at 170 we're fighting barbarena we're fighting luque like what is it that we're doing now are we are we just having some fun fights before we call it a day because if we are we're not putting on fun performances and i don't mean that disparagingly at all but if you want to go out and just throw hell for leather for a couple of fights and go out with a bang fine but it doesn't seem like that's the feeling for rda and so what are we what are we doing now you know i think i think if you're rda you're you're going out there right you're being competitive somewhat you're not getting absolutely sparked unconscious you're not getting put to sleep like let's let's uh, align the career trajectory over recent years that tony ferguson and rafael dos Anjos have gone together now the argument in what we are saying about rafael dos Anjos right now in comparison to tony ferguson well tony ferguson has been put to sleep three out of his last four fights, one by knockout and two by submission. So that tells its own story. What Rafael de Sanos is telling us and probably telling himself and his team and his family is that, you know, he still has it in him to go out there and compete and be competitive and somewhat remain healthy after these fights as well. But Harry, you know, and I know that one fight could change everything there. And, and, you're, and you're teetering on the fine line of, when is the right time? But I, I would be fairly sure that we are going to see Rafael Dos Anjos again, but it's all about the level of competition. Are we going to see him stride towards top 10 or even for a title? No, not yet, no chance of it whatsoever. We need to kind of put him in these Brian Barberena fights or maybe a Vicente Luque. I think, you know, in certain ways, he might be slightly of benefited of, uh, of coming across this version of Vicente Luque, given what Luke has been through in his last couple of fights. I think a more vicious, younger Vicente Luque might have probably got the current RDA out of there. But look at hindsight is, is a great thing, but it, it's the f- big question. And, and it's the question a lot of fighters have to ask themselves and also have to answer as well. It's easy to ask yourself the, the question, Harry, in this scenario. Um, it's very, very hard sometimes to find the answer that you're looking for because you live and breathe this shit. You're not going out there and getting sparked. You're, this is the thing that earns you money. And this is the thing that you're best at. So you're, you know, you're dealt with, what are you going to do next? And RDA is probably asking him that question himself, that question time and time again. Now he probably feels he has a couple left in him, but all it takes is one bad beat down or, or, or one bad knockout. and, And that changes everything. And, Jesus, even with RDA, Harry, he's been through the ringer already. He's been fought the who's who, highest level competition, being a world champion. And um, it's a credit to him that he's still in there. He's still main eventing and still being somewhat competitive. When I say competitive, I mean he didn't go in there and get this fucking shit kicked out of him. Um, Didn't go and get knocked out or seem to have gotten hurt badly in that fight either. So I guess that's a big thing he's going to take away from this fight. Would you agree? Yeah, and I mean, I I even would give him a couple of the rounds in there. Like there were moments when yeah, he yeah. was very effective, and I think the difference for somebody like RDA, and this is, I think we spoke about this previously, is for RDA, he was somebody that managed to move the meta of MMA forward. It was riding the wave, the more modern wave of MMA in that, yes, his style was grappling heavy. Yes, his style was grind heavy, but he knew how to throw punches, right? Like he knew how to slip. He knew how to work the pocket. He knew how to dirty box. He knew how to do all of these things and his ability to meld those together at his peak, at the peak of his powers was really, 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 really good. And that, that very, very solid base of grappling acumen and that very solid base of being defensively aware stands the test of time because he is good enough and has a good enough base 
that he can still be, as you say, competitive. The difference is what does competitive mean for Rafael dos Anjos? Because competitive to us, to you and I sat here watching him, is he's fighting Vicente Luque and he goes out and he has a solid enough performance, comes up short, no problem. If he goes out and let's say he fights Michael Chiesa, probably beats Michael Chiesa like, and so we he wins a fight, good. But we know that Michael Chiesa is not at a level that is going to be touching the, the, the ceilings of that 170 pound division. And so th- it really doesn't matter to us what we determine competitive to be. It's entirely dependent on what Rafael dos Anjos believes competitive to be. Because previously to this fight, obviously, he was talking about he wants to make a run at the title, he wants to do this, he wants to do that. Well, as you and I have just said, that's never happening. That's very far, 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 far away from the ability he has right now. And so it's whether he is willing to get up, go through those training sessions, put himself through the damage and the training camp and the weight cut and the diet and the strength and conditioning regimen to be the level of competitive that his skills allow him to be right now. And only Rafael dos Anjos can answer that question. Absolutely. But even though he's the only person that can answer that question, Harry, I'm still going to ask you, what you would like to see next for both gentlemen, Vicente Luque, maybe first of all, and maybe Rafael dos Anjos after that. Rafael dos Anjos, um, frankly, I would love to see him call time on a career, yes. yeah. mostly because he has nothing left to prove and the fights that he's going to be dealt. Yes, okay, they could be Vicente Luque esque, right? But it's likely that the UFC is going to want to try and build a fighter off the name of Rafael dos Anjos. And that's just something I don't need to see. That's something that I would prefer not to see. It's something that I would prefer Rafael dos Anjos the next time we see him is when he's inducted into a UFC Hall of Fame or, or something of that ilk. So Vicente Luque, I think there's a little bit more gas left in that tank. If we want to do a, I don't know, if we want to do a Jack Della Maddalena, I don't Good have trip. a massive like problem with that, right? Because if Jack Della Maddalena is the guy that we think he is, he beats Vicente Luque, right? But if Vicente Luque goes out and is able to, to grapple the way he did against RDA, well, we've seen that Jack Della Maddalena earlier in his UFC career had some, some issues with some of the grappling situations. And so Vicente Luque is a guy that's going to be able to go out and potentially expose those holes if those holes are still existing. Um, but I also would have no problem with them dialing Luque back and putting him in a Brian Barberena-esque fight where both guys will go toe-to-toe and they'll do the things and they'll throw some leather and they'll do this and they'll do that. So Luque is in that sort of situation where, again, I don't need to see him against anyone with a with a single digit number next to his name. Yeah, it's almost harder to kind of match up these kind of uh, fighters because, you know, you can't really see them going too far up the rankings. But, uh, yeah, I like that JDM call out for Vicente Luque and hopefully Jack Della gets a, a fight for Sydney. I know he's struggling. Obviously, it'll be a little bit too soon for Vicente to go in there again. It'd be interesting to see what happens for both gentlemen in the main event. In the co-main event, Cub Swanson took home another unanimous decision win over Hakim Dawadu um, from Canada. A hotly disputed decision, that being said, Harry, and that was the probably the, the main talking point. Um, shouts of robbery, shouts of scandal by all the betting uh, experts on, on Twitter again this week. But uh, what it was, in fact, was a very, very close fight. Um, and having uh, looked back at it again, um, having it been really close, and and I, I would have given it a non-confident to Cub Swanson on Saturday night watching it live, I would be more confident in saying I would fancy Cub Swanson to take rounds one, rounds two, and Hakim Dawadu taking round three for 29-28 for Cub Swanson. Uh, the judges had it unanimously for Cub Swanson. They were swayed on a couple of different cards, Harry. Um, you know, let's talk about the fight itself first. We'll talk about the score and after. Um, were you impressed with Cub Swanson and his showing here? Were you disappointed with Hakim Dawadu? I don't know if I'm more impressed by Cub or more disappointed by Hakim in this because this has been the kind of the cusp of Hakim's UFC career so far where 
we see flashes of this good fighter and you know you're coming in here and you're being lauded as this Muay Thai world champion and everything like that but you're coming in and getting outstruck by Cub Swanson and it doesn't make any sense to me that he got drawn into so, uh, such a fight like that because the type of fight that Cub Swanson fought, we've seen him fight before. He he just bit down on his gum shield. He closed the distance and wanted to land big shots. And Hakeem just ate it all up and 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 said, "Okay, I'll meet you at the dance." And and it was a bad bad decision overall for him to do that. And the result of the fight is 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 a result of. In my opinion, how Akeem Dawadu fought in this fight, I thought he's a much more technical, much more crisper striker. And I think if he had a fought with a little bit more fight IQ and not got drawn into the battle, he might have won this uh, a little bit more comfortably. And 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 of course, always in some people's eyes, he did win this fight, of course. But the judges saw it for Cub Swanson. Your thoughts on on the fight itself, Harry? Hakeem Dawadu just, I, I mean, to your point. I'm not I'm not more impressed with Cobb Swanson than I am disappointed with Hakeem Dawadu. Like yeah. how many times, how many times do we have to ask for Hakeem Dawadu to just do more? Right? Like you say, all these Muay Thai credentials, all this stuff. There has been so many performances that he's either eked a decision or he's lost a decision based on his activity, right? And the amount of time that he threw that stabbing teep kick and then Nothing. No jabs, no setups. It was either the long teep or whenever they got into clinch situations, he was throwing big bombs and Cub was doing a good job of rolling with punches and landing his own shots. Cub was attacking the body. Hakeem was either trying to slam those body shots in or nothing. And it's just, it's so frustrating when you see that in actuality, Hakeem was the more athletic fighter. He hit much harder. He was much faster. And Cub was able to draw him into this tit for tat, exactly where Cub wanted the fight to be type performance. And even when Hakeem lands on Cub or seemingly like causes Cub to, to be aware of a shot or makes a good read, then just doesn't continue going to the well. Like, it just feels to me like there's a significant lack of fighting IQ from Hakeem Dawadu, whereas Cub Swanson, who's now firmly in the veteranship of his career, is able to draw these sorts of reactions from fighters. I mean, Cub Swanson... Uh, and Cub, Cub made that decision to fight that way as well, Harry, very early on. Um, you know, coming in here thrown wild in the pocket coming out you could see the smile on his face he was like i know what i want to do and and he did it was excellent game planning for him to see if he could uh kind of draw the way the wadu in to kind of these wild exchanges because that was his best chance and he did it very early almost off the first exchange in the fight really yeah i mean i i i wrote as one of my first notes is that it's a fast start from both men, but Cub is doing the better work. And I mean by fast, fast start by both men is that Cub forced the action. Hakeem had to either choose, do I get run over early or do I have to, you know, up the gears myself a little. Um, but I just, I don't know. This fight made me a little bit sad, if I'm honest. And not sad because Cub Swanson won or because he was competitive or whatever, but more sad because Hakeem Dawadu is absolutely never going to be the prospect that we thought he was going to be. He's never going to be able to capitalize on the attributes that he has. And that is a real, real, real shame. Um, you know, Cub Swanson tried a fucking head and arm takedown, right? In 2023 MMA, a head and arm takedown in men's MMA manages to cause a scramble enough that isn't punished like head, if, head and hand stuff for harry powell i guess watching that i was just so shocked like i was like what are we how are we what are we i just what are, i just I, I don't know what to say would you like to guess what what it could be with, with hakeem like why is it just that reluctance to pull the trigger is it you know, sometimes, you know, you can go on a great run and he was on a great run before he went in since coming into the UFC, went on, lost his first fight, went on a five fight win streak. Then in his last 
four fights, three defeats, one win, uh, with losses over Mobstar Evelev, Julian Rosa, and that obviously Cub Swanson, and one win in between against Mike Trezano, who is not great, let's be honest. And that those are wins by unanimous decision either. There's like I can sense that frustration, and frustration is the correct word because I kind of sense that throughout this fight as well, where it was like you like I can't, I'm not I'm not an expert enough to know to, to what exactly it is, but you know you can see a, when you see a good fighter that's not showing themselves to be a good fighter there. And that's exactly what Hakeem Dawadu is. And it's like, you know, being over in Canada, Canadian MMA isn't doing all that well. It's like they're crying at the seams for someone to come out here and and, and take the bull by the horns and bring on Canadian mixed martial arts. Now, Mike Malott is doing a pretty good job in doing that as well. But Hakeem, like you said... Hakeem was a guy that we were talking about and had high promises and high kind of hopes for when he came to came in and broke on the scene. But you're spot on, man. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen at this stage. He's 32 years of age right now. You know, he was put in this co main event slot against a, a legend in Cub Swanson. The UFC didn't want Cub Swanson to win this fight. The UFC were putting in Hakeem there to kind of make his name, like you said, like they do. That's smart business. You know, you, you can't criticize it too much. You can acknowledge it, you can't criticize it. But Hakeem Duradu just. A lot of, lot of talk of fumbling the bags, Harry, but he fumbled the bag big time this uh, in that co main event. Yeah, I think um, I think for Hakeem, there's is a mixture of two things. I think the first is that he wants to fight perfectly, um, and I also think he does not like being the nail. You know, the name that he goes by is Mean Hakeem, right? Well, Mean Hakeem is the idea that he's landing big power shots, big blows uh, with, with sort of violent intentions. There's nothing in that name that says I'm happy to take something to, to give something right. It's a, it's a bully mentality. It's a bully moniker. And when he fights, it feels like he expects his opponents to sort of give him more respect than he deserves, give him more respect than he's earned. But then equally he expects the power that he holds to traverse and fighters to sort of wilt underneath it. Maybe in Muay Thai, that was the case because people were more willing to stand and trade. And so your ability and your efficacy of power is far, far, far greater. But obviously in MMA, the range is so much different and, and the striking is so much different to, to pure Muay Thai that he doesn't have that same ability. But I'm sorry, at this level of your career, you're in the UFC, you've been in the UFC for a considerable amount of time if you haven't been able to to see the problems in your game and change them at this point, it's never going to happen. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And like, if we're talking about, even if when we're talking about who's next for either one of these, it's, it's not even a conversation I'm too interested in having. I mean, Cub Swanson, fair play to him. He's Gary's He's in the win column. He'll likely fight again, you know, very emotional after the fight. It's like, you know, it's, I don't want to disparage Cub all that much because, you know, he's a great guy. He seems like a great guy and, and, and loves doing this. Um, let's talk about the judges scoring of the fight. Harry, you were unsure. Basically, this fight came down to me to an exchange at the end of the second round where Cub Swanson visibly hurt and wobbled Hakeem Dawadu. And um, before that exchange, I was like, Jesus, I was nearly going to have to go back and watch the round again. It was so close. A lot of clinching against the cage, a lot of strikes up in the clinch as well. But it was that final exchange in round two with the body worker, Cub Swanson, and some of the shots inside for him that accumulated for me with the pinnacle being that exchange where that wobbled Hakeem Dawadu at the end of round two, which saw me score rounds one for Cub Swanson, round two for Cub Swanson, and round three for Hakeem Dawadu. Um, but I ain't arguing if someone wants to give it to Hakeem either, even though we are kind of belittling and, 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 and downgrading his performance. Uh, you know, he could have won it on a different night with different scorecards, um, almost did on Saturday night, but, um, we're not really going to be too, too up in arms over the judges scoring of this Harry, are we? No, no, not at all. I mean, that second round was close. Like so it close. Was... This is as close a round that you'll ever, you'll ever see. 
I agreed with you that I thought that the flurry at the end from Cobb and in those last closing seconds where he visibly wobbled Hakeem, those were probably enough. But even watching it live, those shots landed. And as the round ended, I'm like, is is that enough? Like, it, I, I, I asked myself the question, is that enough? And generally, when we see a fight and we see something like that, where it's a significant moment that happens in the round, we take visible notice and we say, okay, well, that's definitely enough to be scored or or maybe that's enough to sway it one way or the other. But Yeah, you're looking for a reason. Like, you're looking for a reason. And, and you know, that's the way the kind of scoring has worked is to give fighters the reason or an opportunity to, to for the judges to score them that round. And in close rounds, it's exchanges like that 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 really make the difference and like i mean you can't with one breath say it was a close fight and then with the other breath say it was horrible judging when you're basing one round off of one exchange that happened over the course of four or five seconds i mean you, you need to get real uh, if you're thinking any other way then it's just a super close fight that could have went either way one more thought before we we we, we move on harry Hakeem Dawood and Nathaniel Wood next, thanks. Lovely. Let's do it. Let's do it. And Cub Swanson versus Paul Hughes. I'm just going to like match up Paul Hughes against both of these guys. I'm going to match up with Paul Hughes against every 145 pounder until he gets signed to the UFC. Even if that means a couple of mismatches, we need to just get him in there and have some fun. Um, someone who did have some great fun was Khalil Roundtree came in talking a big game moved to 12 and 5 after um, knocking out Chris Dawkins who uh, was uh, debuting in the like heavyweight division for the first time didn't go to plan we had talked about this Harry on the preview show was it a good move for Dawkins um, we thought you know in terms of health wise he had the body type to kind of cut down to 205 but things didn't go to plan Khalil Roundtree just decided to meet fire with fire here. Dawkins came out on the attack, wanted to land the bigger shots, but it was Khalil Roundtree who just absorbed those shots from Dawkins, landed a straight right down or straight left down the pipe, and that was it. Um, the, I thought it was a fair stoppage. Um, it could have been gone, could have been went maybe a little bit longer, perhaps, but I think the writing was on the wall pretty much. I think uh, Khalil Roundtree. Pretty clean knockout, pretty clean performance, and he moves on again. I think there's not too too much to say about him moving on. He's talking about going on title runs and everything like that. And I guess you know he had got a reach for the stars, I guess. But I think that's a, a bit of a pipe dream now at this stage for Khalil Roundtree. Your thoughts on on this one, Harry? I didn't think Khalil Roundtree had a clean performance at all. I thought the knockout was great, really, really nice left hand down the pipe. Um, but even like, I think that the fight, the, the epitome of the fight was how how it ended. Ended. So he drops mm. Dorcas. Dorcas shells up, and he takes like a golf swing at him. You know, the first one misses completely, and the second one clatters Dorcas into the side of the head. And I have no problem with the stoppage. Neither did Christoph. No, no, neither do I. I was I was a little, little bit loose lipped when I said that. When I think back on it, it wasn't that it wasn't that that bad. Now, to be honest, Dorcas it was. was Definitely was, hurt. Took yeah. a massive shot immediately after. He was curled up, not even looking at Roundtree, not looking to build up to his feet. So the referee did, you know, made the right choice. Dorcas wasn't looking to improve his position. He wasn't looking to defend himself intelligently. So I have no problem with with the finish. But Roundtree, like for this for this person that's supposedly gone away and in his in his last couple of fights reinvented himself into this. Muay Thai striker with the front leg bouncing and all of this stuff. He just looks really sloppy to me in this one. It felt like Dorcas was the more technical fighter. Now, okay, that's not saying too much for the performance, but Dorcas was looking to land straight shots. He was looking to work the body a little bit. And Khalil just looked like he wanted to go out, throw everything with 100% and knew that something was going to land. And you know, if we're talking about title shots and let's take him at his merit, right? If we're talking about title shots in a 205 pound division, he gets whacked by anyone decent with that sort of game plan. Like he was so open to take shots. It was just massive, big swings. His feet weren't under him when he was swinging. The kicks were nice. There was some really nice high kicks. There was some, some nice stabbing teeps, but I mean, I didn't see anything 
from that Khalil round three performance that would let me go and chuck him in with a person that would put him anywhere near uh, a fight that would make us ask for a title shot, let alone a title shot itself. So no, no, he's like ranked thirteen right now. Um, maybe that will will go up when the rankings come out again tomorrow after we record. But I doubt we'll come up that much. You're looking at people like Dominic Reyes, uh, maybe Ryan Span, and uh, rank number ten might be next for him. But he's going to be lucky to kind of get past anybody in the top 10 in my opinion anyway based off like i mean i don't buy this i i don't buy this kind of rejuvenation i think you know he's a fighter that came on to into the fight game relatively late and is somewhat showing love some levels of improvement later on but uh in his career but it's too too little um too late to be honest for me for Khalil Roundtree whereas that yeah he's a he's a fun fighter fun guy to watch but he's going to get absolutely smoked when he goes in against any form of elite level competition or anybody who's willing and able to take him down I mean you know take the guy down like why don't why doesn't Dawkins go in there and try and fucking take him down is uh, that's what I was kind of wondering in this fight and don't play into someone's strengths but uh look at doc has found out the hard way it's hard it's easy to be the general after the battle as the lad says but uh i mean not too much to take away from this from this fight harry eh? not at all um and i mean why are you would you be thinking maybe ryan span next for khalil roundtree do you even care what's next for him i mean it's harsh to say i don't care right like Obviously, I will watch whenever he fights next time. But a Ryan Span type name is is just fine for me. What's Vulcan Uzdemir doing these days? Do that yeah. fight. Yeah. Throw him in there with anybody. But uh, we shall move on to the 115-pound division. Ishmael Lucindo took out Pollyanna Viana by arm triangle choke in the second round. Um. I mean, the big story coming in here was Pollyanna Viana giving it the big one about not being uh, being let dressed in cosplay. She looked like she was dressed in cosplay as a fighter there on Saturday night because, I mean, you can't be giving it the big one about what you walk into the octagon wearing if you can't go into the octagon and produce. And, um, I mean, that she let herself down, I think, on Saturday night when she really underperformed against uh, Ishman Lucindo wasn't a great performance here from Pollyanna Viana, and I think Ishmael Lucindo took a big, big advantage of the fact um, that she didn't really have too much of a challenge in there. How would you kind of assess both women's performance in this fight? Uh, it was Viana's fight to lose, and she lost it. Like yeah. Lucindo has has got a long, long, long way to go. Um, her strategy is be a Tasmanian devil until you get to a body lock. And then when you get to a body lock, you hit an outside trip and then do things on the ground. Like the first takedown uh, from Viana was was really nice. Um, there was some good work from Viana. Then uh, Lucindo manages to reverse the position, ends up on top, is doing some things, but not a ton of damage to finish the first round. And then the second round where it eventually ends, like there's a really nice body shot from Lucindo early. But other than that, it's all just horrendously untechnical, fiery, awful hook crap until yeah. we get to a body lock. Then, you know, listen to in the second round, did some nice guard passing. And then when she was, the, the one thing that I liked about the groundwork was she forced double unders early, which is yeah. not something you see very often from half guard. And, and the reason why it's useful is because it means you can pass to either side, right? You can knee cut to either side. You can look to to force back exposure on either side should you wish to because you've got the ability of double unders. And it also meant that as and when uh, Viana had to pick a decision as to which arm she wanted to free first, Lucindo obviously was able to, to jump on the head and arm. She was setting her up. Would you look at that more of, so of this being a successful setup for submission or Pollyanna Viana kind of maybe leaving her arm there as a way to escape uh, her bad performance. I mean, she just didn't show up on Saturday night, in my opinion. No, I think it was. A, I think it was a good setup. Um, mm. You know, you you can't 
you would always try and reclaim the near underhook first, um, mostly because you will use that to get up uh, or you'll use that to frame enough that you can then win the second one and then get up. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I was not impressed by either woman's performance, frankly. I thought that Lucindu, you know, okay, she won the fight. The head and arm... The application was nice. She jumped on it really quickly. Fair play to her. The the double unders half guard passing was nice, but the rest of it was was not great. Like not great. yeah, very poor. And um, moving on to middleweight mediocrity next uh, two sets of fights. I think this was about the time when I found it most difficult with the card because these three fights. Um, look, we already talked about Lucindo, Viana. We were going to talk about AJ Dobson. And then Chuck Wee and obviously Josh Fremd versus Jamie Pickett. But we'll talk about AJ Dobson and Tafan and Chuck Wee next. Just, just I can sum this up for you. Yeah, please do. Sum please this up do. For you. AJ Dobson's a better fighter. He just doesn't hit hard enough. That's it. He's just, he didn't really show any want to try and finish this fight. And Chuck Wee obviously came in miles overweight. He was like four pounds overweight for this fight. That's not going to help AJ Dobson, who probably felt that he had to kind of go in and get the job done by any means necessary. Obviously, when you're going in there against a bigger dude, fair play to AJ Dobson for taking that fight number one. But um, Tafon and Chukwe at six to six and four on a main card of a UFC event. Um, I'd be very surprised if I seen that happen again, to be honest, Harry. It's fucking, it was terrible. Like, yeah, I mean, and Chuck, we just hits hard, right? That's yeah. it. And 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 for Dobson, look, D- Dobson showed in spades that he's a far, far, far more skilled, more technical fighter than Nchukwi. He just forced him to eat counters all day long. Now, I totally understand if I'm Nchukwi, uh, sorry, if I'm if I'm AJ Dobson, your man's come in fucking 700 pounds overweight. 100%. And he's coming in also on a two-fight losing streak as well. So the pressure is on AJ Dobson here. So, like, I mean, I'll acknowledge it wasn't great, but I do understand the performance in some, some ways and terms, you know? 100%. If you go in and you try and throw leather with Unchukwi and you catch a stray one I mean you're staring up at the lights like he yeah, hits and, you're not, and you don't probably have a job in the UFC anymore either so right. and so you go out and you win in the most efficient way necessary and I was impressed with the technical ability of Dobson that's not to say I was I wasn't unimpressed with the technical ability of Tuff and Unchukwi <laughs> yeah, but yeah. you know in the first two rounds he showed that speed and technique beats massive power and then in the third round he just took his chance and ran Anchukwi down when he caught the kick and, and just kept him there. Anchukwi is like horrendous, like just grabbing yeah. and holding from close guard, not even a trying to get up. Um, yeah, awful. And I mean, if you make me talk about Josh Ram, Jason, uh, Jamie Pickett, I won't be happy. Like, I will uh, not. it's going to happen. But like, look, let's finish off here with Anchukwi. If we see this man in the UFC, um, if we see this man in the UFC, I don't know. He must have some fucking secrets on some of the higher brass because he's probably Dunsky at this stage. Four uh, defeats in his last five fights and just terrible. And you, when you miss weight by four or five pounds as well, you're not doing yourself any favor in the eyes of the UFC brass. And I don't think that Josh Fremd or Jamie Pickett are going to see uh, any favorable behavior from the UFC brass after their uh, opening fight. We talked about this fight, Harry, and the preview show. We were wondering why they put it as the main card opener, and it was it was just as dreadful as we could have imagined. It just wasn't a good fight whatsoever. Neither man could do anything in the clinch. Neither man was useful out in the open. The only good read that Josh Fremd had was that uh, two good reads was the sidekick to the right leg. That was a nice read, and the second one was he was trying to time Jamie Pickett with that knee up the middle, but couldn't time Jamie Pickett with the knee up the middle, even though he was being sold like it was a fucking mortgage deal, right? Like it was right there for it. He couldn't land it. And I mean, you know, DC's ribbiting on about how Jamie Pickett's improved, even though he's losing this fight. That's all you oh, need to Oh, yeah, for fuck's sake. Fucking I, didn't, I, I just don't even lit. Like I have, I have just an unbelievable ability to zone out when I'm, I watch it with the sound on, but don't listen to the commentary. It's like... Like you're talking about Jamie Pickett 13 and 10 now, four lost his fast four fights, and you're trying to big him up for some reason. I don't know whether he's a friend of DC or whatnot, but yeah, you've got to call it as it is on the desk. And, and DC does be living in a world of his own at sometimes. Like, it's I mean, crazy. the amount like Jamie Pickett had the turtle 
twice or three times, like a really good turtle position. DC's lording over the fact that Jamie Pickett grabbed your man's ankle. And I'm like, what are we, like, what are we, what are we doing, lads? And then the next time he had his back, like actually had his back, was looking for hooks and locks up a Kimura and like drops over the top of Fremd for a Kimura. And I'm like, just sass, just get him out now. Stop the fight and just fucking give him his bag. <laughs> yeah, give him the P45. Get like, what him are, up there. What are we doing? Yeah, um, we're, we're, what we're doing is we're going to move on to the opening fight on the prelims card, and that's Marcus McGee, because in fairness to old Marcus, he did give us something to talk about in this fight. Um, and unfortunately, JP Boys was the victim of a first-round knockout. He lost his last four fights in a row, and I feel bad for JP Boys who came in with a little bit more hype. I don't. I think JP Boys Harry, is a better fighter than to have lost his last four fights, for sure. He just came in against a couple of good guys, and Marcus McGee was on one. I mean, he had a lot of buzz coming into this card, went out there, landed a sweet right hook, and got the job done inside um, uh, three minutes on, uh, on the prelims headliner. I mean, ticking off all the boxes here is Marcus McGee. Great post-fight speech. You know, a guy that we can keep an eye on, uh, at the very least keep an eye on um, in the immediate 135 pound division, which is absolutely shit hot right now. Yeah, I mean, there's just something interesting about McGee. I can't quite put my finger on it yet. I've not quite, I've not quite yet found out what it is that I like about him. Um my, I like my... it that there's no bullshit about it. There's no bullshit. Like he he goes in, he, you can tell he enjoys being there. You can tell he loves and wants to be a UFC fighter. He loves UFC. Uh, he loves kind of going in there and fighting and finishing. And, you know, there's a lot to be said about going in there and being your natural self and just being you. And, and being comfortable with being yourself. And there's a lot of people out there that are not doing that. And there's a lot of fighters out there that are, would be led along the illusion that that's not the right thing to do to progress your career. But there's a lot to say about Marcus McGee because anytime I see him talk or I see him compete and he's a guy I can maybe relate to as uh, in certain ways and only way is that his, he is himself like and, and he isn't comfortable being himself and just a likable person. And uh, there's a lot to say. It's obviously it's easy when you're going out there and fucking putting guys away in the first round as well. That's definitely going to help your case. But he's just like a, this 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 average guy who's a really fucking good fighter in the UFC, and it's kind of nice to see that. It's a little bit of natural kind of personality shine through. Yeah, I mean, I I haven't consumed much of like who he is as a person. Um, as, as I've said, I don't really watch press conferences and that sort of thing. I just prefer to look at what the fighters are fighting, like what they're actually doing and what they're telling me about themselves through their fighting. But I just enjoy his, how much of like a sniper he is right now. Yeah. I'm not going to get too much on my horses or whatever, but that sniping style is one that we've grown to love from the Wonder Boys, the Conor McGregor's in some fashion and Anderson Silva. Now, those are absolutely insanely lofty names to put Marcus McGee into, but I just like that style of fighting. I think it's very effective when it's done well. And the thing I enjoyed in this specific fight is as he slips his head off the center line and lands that right hand, he knows immediately immediately he knows that he's landed and he's landed flush. And as JP Byers goes down, he immediately doesn't need any more. He doesn't need to land any more. He looks at the ref, his hands are up, and he's like, do you really, do you need me to do Unreal. anything else? Yeah, some level of control there. Right. And so that, I think, is 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 something that's very rare. Like We don't see it very often. I remember um, Umar Nurmagomedov when he finished Honey Barcelos, and he lands the right, the left hook, and immediately he looks at the ref like, "Oh fuck, what have I done?" Most famous one, Leota Machida versus um, what's his name? Oh god, I had it on the tip of my tongue there. Um, the wrestler guy, Mark Munoz, that time when he bowed in front of him. Like, like it's a level of respect that's pure mixed martial arts. But I like, I'm always a guy that is, you know, you you have to fight until the referee pulls you off. But I think Marcus McGee knew in that instance because you can get a sense of when a punch lands as well on on how good it connected and how well you thrown it as well. And he had just a full sense of awareness there and that finish to immediately pull away and not cause any more damage there. And you have to give him credit in, in the height of the madness. He was very cool, calm and composed in that situation. Definitely. Um, and we said in the previous show, and I think I think it's sort of 
still stands true here is you kind of have to push him now. You know? Oh yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. You got to get him up there. Time is not on his side, right? So let's see. You know, just give me, just give me somebody, anyone. Go like, on, give me your name. Go on. One thirty-five is absolutely fucking flames right now. I mean, move <sighs> him up to one forty-five and have him play fight against Paul Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking, only joking, only joking. Like, I know that this might be a little out there, but what about Rob Font? Like, I know similar timelines, right? Yeah, and I like it's, it. Uh, fuck it, let's find out, right? If he goes in and he beats Rob Font, all right, cool. We've got someone. Let's let's do that. Um, Poor Rob Font will be thinking, hey, I just jumped in here in short notice and saved the UFC main event, and now you're going I to give me Marcus Trump, McGee. <laughs> and, and you could argue that, but I like that fight. I think it's the perfect stylistic matchup for him. But he's not going to be short of any contenders, man in the 135 pound division you could almost stick him in there like you said against anybody and it'd be very interesting to see like i mean that's uh that is a real cauldron of talent now uh, in the 135 pound division but we'll we'll move on we, we'll be we'll surely talking about marcus mcgee again down the line terence mckinney talking about fighters taking fights at short notice came in here at short notice didn't look like the guy who took it at, at, at short notice five days notice I, I see you putting up the five days notice sign it looked like mike breeden was the guy who came in here and took the fight on short notice the way both of these guys matched up it was just a complete and utter mismatch this fight from the very start bell and the writing was on the wall very early stages here harry there's levels to this there's levels. We can we can talk about how McKinney has disappointed us. We can talk about how McKinney has sort of faltered in in some of his decision making. But there's levels to this. Like there's absolutely levels to this. And all we need to say about this is that it was absolute decimation from Terence McKinney. Like don't get me wrong, coming in you lose your fight in your UFC debut and it's a bit more well-matched and Terrence McKinney puts his hand up and you accept the fight fine, but there's levels like there's levels. Absolutely. Like, I mean, with all due respect to Mike Breeden, it's not looking good for him. It's not looking good for him inside the UFC. I couldn't see him being around all that much. Look at obviously coming in against Terrence McKinney, fair play to him. He took that fight as well, but that's three in a row. Uh, for Mike Breeden, and um, yeah, I, I, I can't see him being around too, too much anymore. One guy I can see being around for quite some time, Harry, was that of Isaac Dulgarian, who the severe spotlight shone on this weekend. Um, it was a hot, uh, the, well, a, a hotly contested severe spotlight. I think we'll talk about Jacqueline Amarim in, in just a few moments, but first of all, Harry, I'm going to send it straight over to you. First round, ground and pound win. For Isaac Dolgarian, who put on a clinic really against Francis Fire Marshall, who himself is a very good fighter and has performed well before, but Isaac Dolgarian came in here, climbed to six and zero, oh, and this guy is is definitely worth a watch in the one hundred and forty five pound division. Yeah, I mean, you know, we talked just before about Mike Breeden and when we talked about UFC debuts, and UFC debuts are tough things, right? Like they're tough things, especially when you're in a variety of different stages in your career, but regardless of whether you're nearing the end of your career and you get the call up or you're a 21, 22, 23 year old fighter, the UFC is what you dream of, right? The UFC is where the big money is. The UFC is where the big show, the big famous shiny gold belts are like, this is the place as a fighter that you want to go and be in. And so when you get that call up, there's so many emotions that go through it. There are so many things that can happen, so many variables on fight night, et cetera, et cetera. And Dolgarian comes out and, you know, Francis Fire Marshall is a fighter that we're all pretty high on. We're pretty high on, like, good prospect in that 145 pound. Very good. Like, he looked very good on the Contender Series, looked very good upon his entry into the UFC as well. Okay, lost one. That's okay. But, you know, what made it more impressive for me and Dolgarian here is, is the guy who he's fighting, the guy who's coming off his first career defeat uh, against William Gomez, who in his own right, you know, very good fighter too. So, um, you know, Dolgarian did come in. I mean, you know, it don't doesn't always work out that way for for UFC debuts. A lot of moving parts, a lot of things going on, but he handled everything with with with, with 
perfectly almost really in getting that first round submission um or the the um first round ground and pound sorry um and how uh, how impressed are you? How far do you think that Dulgaria might be able to go in that 145 pound division? So I don't see anything that tells me title contender, right? Um, there was a, uh, the thing that was impressive and you know, there's, there's, there's a few things that were impressive, but one of the things that stood out to me as being ultra impressive was the awareness of when and how the fight should be conducted. And what I mean by that is they open up and there's a couple of leg kicks. There's like four leg kicks, right? One is Dolgarian cutting an angle. They then trade a leg kick. And then as Dolgarian brings his feet together, Fire Marshal throws a really low calf kick, really nicely timed. And it sort of snaps Dolgarian's legs together and off balances him for, you know, a, a minuscule of a second. I can think- I interrupt for one second? Uh, I, just a, a flash thought that came here, completely off topic here. Now this is me, this is me being outraged. W- was this two spotlight veterans kind of going at it here? One, one, one. Did Marshall have the spotlight shot on him once before as well? Yes, Crazy. I'm pretty confident he has. Yeah, Crazy. yeah, me too, me too. Yeah, sorry about that. That's just I completely derailed that. No, no, I, that's interesting. I'm not sure that's ever happened before. Yeah, I was. I just kind of came to my head where it was like, yeah, I remember Fra- Francis Marshall was, but yeah, where I, I given your ride, that's going to be happening plenty more down the line as well. Yeah, well, yeah, sure. I mean, I um, yeah. So, so the leg kicks came together, and I think Dolgarian realized that not necessarily that he was going to be outstruck on the feet or not necessarily that, oh shit, that leg kick really, really hurt. I need to change the fight immediately. I just think he saw that it wasn't the most efficient method for him to conduct the fight in. And the takedown itself wasn't great, right? It was super sloppy and and the head was in the wrong position and the arms were outstretched and whatever. But he gets the fight down and from that moment onwards, you're like, oh, okay, this guy knows how to fight. Like It felt like he needed something to ground himself in and when he got the takedown, he grounded himself immediately and felt right at home, very comfortable. We talk all the time about adherence to scoring criteria. Well, it was a seamless transition between damage and positional dominance. And it was something I really, really enjoyed to watch. And the thing that you don't get very often, which I think was interesting, is he basically never, he didn't get hit. Like He took yeah. a couple of leg kicks. But he took very, very little damage on the bottom. A couple of pot shots from from um, from Francis Fire Marshall when Fire Marshall was looking to improve his position and and get some space and whatever. But for the most part, didn't get hit at all. And that's not something you can say very often in a fist fight in a UFC debut. So um, I think you asked how far do I see him being able to go? That's a very difficult question. It is. Obviously, it is, of course. Yeah, very unfair all, question. All we've seen is 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 a single round's worth of of uh, uh, of effort, especially at this level. Um, I suspect that we will see him in some very interesting fights in in the coming months. I would like to see him against a good grappler that we will be able to showcase a little bit more of his stand up skills. I want to know whether that leg kick was a, oh, fuck, I've been caught. I need to change levels quickly. Or whether that was a, ah, I don't need to be here, right? I could just yeah. take this down and maul him, right? Like, I don't need to do this. Uh, that That's something that's very interesting to me. But ask me the question again in two or three fights, and I'll give you a better answer. Yep, for sure. From one seamless transition to another, Martin Bulley locked up a <laughs> Kimura win over... Uh, Josh Parisian, um, Harry is signaling into wave arm. We'll give it a quick one minute. Not that impressive here, Harry, but uh, I mean, just be a, a, a much inferior fighter on the night, really, to being honest. A little bit of a mismatch in this fight, too, hey? I mean, Parisian is just not a great fighter, right? Like, yeah. he's very tough. He took a lot of shots. Um, I would have been happy to see the fight stopped standing, frankly. Uh, Parisian was was turning away, shying away, wasn't throwing back, um, not with any efficacy anyway, and and so I wouldn't have minded seeing the fight uh, uh, stop standing. The only thing that was cool uh, is that as Baudet got the fight to the ground, he locked up essentially a crucifix, like a, a backwards crucifix, um, in that he trapped the arm of, of Josh Parisian as he then locked up a Kimura. And that's cool because, you know, one of the things that Parisian might want to do is build some height to try and take some of the pressure off the Kimura and then obviously look to 
defend with his hands and lock his hands together and do all that stuff. And Bidet obviously denied that, so that was cool. But overall, like, like I, again, I don't mean to be rude. I don't mean to be mean, but Bidet came out of this and said that this was the first UFC performance that he was happy with. And I'm like, happy with that performance? Fucking A, lads. Let's move on. Let's move on, Windy. Jacqueline Amarim took out Montserrat Ruiz, second round, third round, ground and pound win. And she showcased a lot of her abilities too. Look, we were talking about fighters, Harry, that came in and didn't perform up to standard for the UFC debuts. Obviously, that wasn't the case um, in the last fight we talked about. And, and it was the case for Amarim in her UFC debut. She lost against Sam Hughes on her debut, but came out cited that she wasn't herself on her debut, but showed exactly who she was against Montserrat Ruiz on Saturday night. Dominated on the feet, dominated the grappling exchanges, showed good technical ability on the feet, showed good technical ability on the mat as well, defensively and attack-minded, and did very well to push on and get the win as well, where she could have just eased herself into a decision. She refused to do that. And I think, you know, that's stuff that impresses me a lot as well and this was you know a, a spotlight worthy uh kind of performance but obviously she was uh, a little bit uh updone by dulgarian himself but look at we'll still give her her flowers here on the breakdown it was a really good performance and i'm sure you're just as impressed as what i was yeah fantastic performance like the the the, the reason why she didn't get the spotlight this time was solely because of the the competition that she was facing sure um Monterey Ruiz is a very tough woman, very, very tough woman. She gutted out two really, really, really deep armbar attempts, um, and she took a lot of shots, a lot of damage in those ground and pound exchanges throughout those three rounds. Um, and on the feet, whenever she had a chance, she was absolutely throwing. She was absolutely in that fight the whole way through. So uh, props to her for for the toughness. But Amarim, I completely agree. The 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 fight she lost, uh, Sam Hughes is a is a tough, gritty wrestler. And you know, if you're willing or able to shut down the grappling game, the the more sport generic jiu jitsu generic grappling game of somebody like Amarim, then I think obviously she will struggle. The the work on the feet was good. It wasn't anywhere near as good as the work on the ground. And I think if we're looking to see Amarim kick on, I want to see more from her in the striking displays. But if anyone is is able to hit hit bump sweeps, Kimura sweeps from close guard, close guard, flower sweeps, these sorts of things, you have my attention. And there's a moment in the second round when she locks up a beautiful armbar on Monterey Ruiz. And Ruiz guts it, manages to to almost get to a hitchhiker, which is when you're you pass your arm from the breaking hip to the non-breaking hip. And she starts to turn in, and Amarim turns it into a back crucifix and almost gets a one-arm rear naked choke. Like that's high-level shit right there. She absolutely knows her way around the mat. And and that was a really, really impressive performance. I think referee Jason Herzog was really looking for a way to stop the fight by the end of that third because Monterey Ruiz had just taken so much damage. Um, but I was very impressed with Amarim's use of the gift wrap. I was very impressed with her ability to continuously search for dominant positions, moving in between uh, a damage and submission offense. Like just overall really, really solid performance. Really I use the word, I use the word butchered. She butchered Montserrat Ruiz throughout that fight, landing big damage on the ground. It's like, you know, you can get the fight down, but you've got to be able to do something in those positions. We do know that. And that's not a problem for Jacqueline Amory. Very, very good performance and very excited to see her next fight in there as well, whoever that may be against. But we shall move on. The Mon Blackshear, we, we, we gave him his flowers uh, during the preview show. We had... Uh, said that we we seen a good fighter in there somewhere, uh, had a lot of ups and downs, came against some tricky opposition, but came out, and this was really his best performance of his UFC career so far, in my opinion. And obviously we're going to say that having pulled off a twister, only the third ever time we've seen a twister inside of the octagon. Uh, he took out uh, Jose Johnson after three minutes and 47 seconds of the first round. But... Um, Similar enough to Amarim, you know, asserted his dominance before the finish actually came and found that gap on the mat. Um, the finish itself, Harry, talk me through the mechanics of a twister. Are 
are you a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu expert or are you facing a guy who is not that ground savvy when you're getting, when you're putting on a twister or getting caught in a twister? Explain to me the mechanics of a twister. Uh, I'm sure that's a very loose ended question and there's a lot of variations attached to it as well. Yeah. So, so the, the, the basic mechanics of a twister is that it's a rotational spine submission, right? Like you are twisting the hips one way and you're twisting the neck another way right? Generally, it's done from using what's called a twister hook, which is essentially creating uh, a triangle wedge behind your opponent's bottom leg. And you're using that to, to bridge their hips one way. And then the, the connection that you have on your partner's spine with their hand laced behind your head, you're pulling and twisting their spine towards you right so it's a pretty nasty finish um it's a pretty uncomfortable position to find yourself in the the answer to the question about does jose johnson know what was happening i think he did know what was happening maybe a little bit too late like really when you're in a twister one of the benefits of the truck hook which is the 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 leg entanglement is that it's hard for you to build your hip height up and escape the back right like that's one of the one of the benefits of it if you had a if demon black actually had a regular hook on the bottom side at the at the time he didn't have any top hook or he didn't have what's called a high ball ride where you cover the hip and Jose Johnson would have been able to just pop his hip higher than Blackshear and either turn in completely and put Demone Blackshear on his back or create a scramble and, you know, build up and whatever, whatever. But Demone Blackshear realized early that he was going to use the truck hook as a control method. I don't think he had Twister in his brain immediately, but what Jose Johnson made the mistake of doing is trying to off uh, remove his back from the center line. Right, so he tried to shuck his back to the mat with a twister hook. That's really, really difficult because you can't move your hips effectively. And so then I think when when Jose Johnson started to strike against Damone Blackshear, that's the big mistake because Blackshear just hooked his hands up, put it behind his head, and now we're in twister territory. For a long time, Jose Johnson did a good job at hand fighting, and Damone Blackshear had actually an inefficient grip to finish. The twister, he had like a like a rear naked choke type anaconda type grip over the jaw of, of Jose Johnson, whereas really you want to get like an S grip or a gable grip at worst, just at the top of the head. Like you want to try and bend the head at the place that it's got the most leverage, and obviously that's yeah. at the very top. Um, but predominantly Damon Blackshear realized, I think, when when the fight got to the ground in its instance in its first instance that that he had the beating of jose johnson there i was impressed with how dialed in demon blackshear was from the very 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 start i know that this sounds strange for a first round finish but his cardio looked great uh it looked like he wasn't putting everything everything into all of his shots it didn't look like he was going to gas himself out from throwing those shots and so from an overarching perspective i would agree with you that this is his best career performance to date okay we don't really know because it's not been ufc tested the level of competition that he faced on the night but sure. he hit a twister only the third twister that's a pretty impressive feat and to do it in the way that he did was impressive also Absolutely. I couldn't agree anymore. Uh, and that moves us on to another impressive feat. And I'm absolutely blown away that Juliana Miller was able to win the Ultimate Fighter competition because, my goodness, she is dreadful. Like, I think you probably would have seen a better level of striking from a YouTube boxing fight than, than she was able to showcase there against Luana Santos in the opening fight. Santos went on to win the fight by TKO um, towards the end of the first round. Um, uh, gosh, I don't even know what to say without being mad disrespectful towards Juliana Miller. Look at, she goes in there, she tries her best, but she's just not good enough, Harry. Like, I mean, it's almost hurting on the eyes to watch somebody fight like that within the UFC. It's not, not good. It's like one of the worst performances that I can remember there in recent history inside the UFC Octagon. If, and, and, and that's me and being not that critical at all to be honest i think that's pretty safe to say what what's your assessment on 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 this fight like i mean Luana santos went in there and got the win but you know she wasn't really showcasing too much levels of of, of high quality in there herself it was just a really 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 bad fighter against a really really bad fighter and the really really bad fighter got the win in Luana santos 
So it felt to me like the game plan for Juliana Miller, and this is never a smart game plan in, in women's MMA, but the game plan was to go out and try and finish the fight in under two minutes. That was the game plan. She went out there like an absolute bat out of hell. Not great at all, but she just tried to set a pace. She just tried to land loads of volume, and she did, right? In the first sort of 25 seconds, Miller was landing loads. Again, not pretty, not nice, not great, but Santos was just taking them all. Like, didn't know really where she was, was absolutely, it seemed confused by the efficacy of, of Miller's striking. And eventually Miller just punched herself out. Like, and then Santos was able to stick around long enough that she was able to land her own shots. I mean, the, the worst performance in the UFC, I mean, shout out Cindy Dandua. Um, <laughs> yeah, not great. Let me see that fight. <laughs> Bring Cindy Dandua for one fight against Junella Miller. Let's see that fight. Um, let's oh, not. God. But yeah, I mean, um, we have to call a spade a spade. And that's the fair play to Juliana Miller for lacing the gloves and making the walk and, you know, doing all that stuff. But this is, we, we can't accept this. As like you wouldn't, you wouldn't really ex uh, uh, accept that at a regional level, even Harry. Like to be honest, if we're being real, like you know, the final stages of the fight where Juliana Miller isn't even looking at her opponent; she's just facing down and winging punches into space. Here, it's like, whew, what are we doing here? It's like, I don't know, man. It's yeah, not the best way to get the fight, uh, the 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 fight night started, and and. Like, I mean, I guess it couldn't have got any worse after that, to be honest, though. But just sad old situation, really, isn't it? Yeah, not a great fight. Um, I, I I don't mind not seeing either of them fight again. Absolutely. Performance of the night went to Cleal Roundtree. Uh, Ishmael Lucindo took home 50,000. Marcus McGee, 50,000. And Damon Blackshear for his twister. They all took home the big bucks. In another fight night card in the UFC Apex. Harry, I'll send it over to you. Final overall briefing of the card before we finish up for the latest edition of the Balance Breakdown. I think giving the bonus or a bonus to Lucindo over Dogarian is fucking criminal like, but sure, these things happen in MMA. Absolutely. Uh, Harry Powell can be found at BJJ underscore Harry Powell on Twitter, Instagram, wherever you find your social media briefings. I only LMMA is where you'll get me at. Go over there and check out the severe spotlight by Harry on severemma.com. And that is on, like I said, Isaac Dulgarian. He didn't get the $50,000 bonus, but he did get the severe spotlight. And Mon would argue that might mean a lot more to the man in uh the coming years take care folks we'll be back for the big ufc card this weekend from boston in a few days we'll see you then take care we'll talk to you 